Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, be Sabbath. It's not quite Sabbath here yet, but it won't be in too long a time. Uh, or it will be in not too long a time. Um, so uh, before we be begin with the prayer, I just want to mention that we're, we're studying this th Three Angels' Messages of Righteousness by Faith. We had read a, a lot of material, the 1893, the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. And we're going to take a slow, a short diversion into some of the history uh, behind what was happening in 1888 and afterward. Um, there's lots of different materials that I want to look at um, and that will help us uh, sort of sort through that I'm going to direct you to. We're not going to read everything because uh, it'd be a lot of material. Uh, but anyway, before we begin... Can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the blessing of fellowship and fellowship with you and with your children. And we are thankful, Lord, for the time that we have um, this evening. We invite your spirit's presence to be here as we look at some of our history of Seventh-day Adventism, as we open the scriptures, and as we seek to know you better. We just pray that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts, that you can show us our sins in need of you, and that we can forsake our sins, that you can give us strength, and that we can re reflect your character to all around us. We pray for each person studying for truth. We ask that the Holy Spirit can work upon their hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone, again. So, uh, this what you see in front of you is, uh, well, it's not the original, because I've seen... Uh, you know, where they do the, the the microfiche. It was from microfiche of the Topeka, Kansas Daily Capital um, articles. So um, what we have in front of us is the camp meeting. And, it, and it's interesting. So they did this camp meeting in Topeka, Kansas. And um, these were huge, uh, you know, very public, very, the, the way the camp meetings were originally designed is these were what we would now call an evangelistic series. Uh, it was very similar to an evangelistic series. The idea of the camp meeting is that you would have a camp meeting and you would invite your neighbors and people that you were studying with uh, to these camp meetings and they would hear the, the truths of Adventism presented to them in various ways. Our camp meetings aren't really evangelistic series anymore because we have a, a fixed camp site usually. Um, and it's just more a social gathering for Adventists. But originally, we would have these camp meetings in different uh, different towns or cities, and they would be advertised to the public. And um, and the newspaper reporters uh, would go to these meetings and take uh, notes of what the speakers were saying. And and sometimes they don't quite get things right um, in that because if they're not Seventh Day Adventists. They may not really understand what's being said. And I've noticed when I read through uh, this one, uh, there was things that uh, didn't really sound like Jones or didn't really sound like Ellen White. So Ellen White spoke at this camp meeting as well as A.T. Jones, if I remember correctly. It's been about 30 years since I read these articles, these uh, sermons. But um, the reason why we're going to look at this. So we had spent time. Um, doing some uh, basic groundwork with uh, Jones and Wagner, the message of righteousness by faith, 1888. Um, when we first started this series on the three angels messages of righteousness by faith. And then uh, we read A.T. Jones, 1893 general conference bulletin sermons and the 1895 general conference bulletin. So those are a lot of sermons, a lot of uh, reading and I could have just taken the highlights from it, from those presentations. 
uh, but I really didn't feel that it did justice. And I know people can just read them on their own. You know, I could have taken highlights and people could read them. But uh, there's something to be said when you read together and, you know, things are read expressively and we reference things that we wouldn't pick up on our own. And so I think it was really beneficial doing that. Now, I'm not going to do that with the Topeka, Kansas Daily Capital. I'm just going to note some of the history that's involved here. And a little bit of this is also personal testimony. So my discovery of this message of righteousness by faith uh, when I first became an Adventist. So I'm going to just talk a bit about that as well. So when I became an Adventist in 1982, December 25th, 1982, I'd only been to the Adventist church once before I was baptized, and that was I think like three weeks before I was baptized. So I think I was there the first week of December. And then I got baptized December 25th, me and my first wife. Um, my son, Matt, was just uh, a little baby. And uh, my first wife was pregnant with our second son, Joseph, who was born uh, about five weeks, five weeks and one day after uh, his mom was baptized. So he, he was baptized twice, he always says. Um, but, uh, and, and he put off getting baptized for a long time because as a kid, he'd always say, I don't need to be baptized. I was already baptized. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but when I came into the Adventist church, it's at a time where, uh, we had had the 1970s and the 1970s in, uh, the Adventist church um, and I'm always so bad with names, but it was, um, what was the guy's name? Ro Robert, who was the conference president in the 1970s? Anybody remember? I have to get his name. I always get mixed up, but yeah, Robert Pearson. Okay. So um, he was the uh the conference president uh, from 1966 to 1979. And he was a conservative. And what they were doing in, in the 70s is there was this attack that was happening um, because of the book Questions on Doctrine and some of the leaders that had preceded uh, Pearson. Um where we had uh, basically an undermining of the prophetic message of Adventism as well as the message of righteousness by faith. Now, from my perspective, um, when I became an Adventist and I started reading Adventist material, is um, I, I felt that Adventists were legalists. Now, that may be an odd thing to say, but I'm not talking about the conservative Adventists, the ones, the ones that I identified with, that I got along with. I didn't consider them to be legalists, but it was more what I would call the cultural Adventists were legalists. And, and that's because I already had an understanding of righteousness by faith just because of the fact that I became a Christian and I had read the New Testament many times, and especially um, Paul's writings, and in particular Galatians and Romans, as well as John's letters. And of course, my, my favorite gospel was the Gospel of John. So, um, and, and I had this interest in, in the book of Revelation as well. So when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, and I looked at how uh, Adventists talked about God, how they talked about sin and how they talked about salvation. It seemed that they, what they had was, you know, you do your best and God does the rest. And that's a form of legalism. That is, they had a type of legal re religion that um, was a counterfeit of righteousness by faith. That is, they didn't understand the principles of the gospel. So I'm just a young guy. I mean, I'm 
I got baptized. I was still 19 years old. Um, um, so I, you know, I started uh, writing a letter shortly after I became an Adventist. I wrote a letter and, and uh, made copies of it, photocopies back then, a uh, handwritten letter to the, the pastor and the elders and the deacons of the church that I went to, which was a fairly large church. And it's in central and, um, and basically just uh, maybe giving them a kind of a dressing down when it came to what I had, had seen and heard in my short time as an Adventist for a couple of months. So, so, um, there was also at that time, um, we had a Sabbath school teacher who was a follower of Desmond Ford. So we know that, uh, Oh, I got, four, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so remember, I got baptized in December 25th, 1982, and I was converted on August 11th, 1980 as a Christian, not as a Seventh-day Adventist, but that's when I gave my heart to God, asked him to take over my life and to begin the work of changing me. So within, you know, well, it was just a bit over two years, I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I'd started keeping the Sabbath. Um in the summer of 1982, or nine, yeah, 1982, before I became an Adventist, before I'd gone to an Adventist church, already accepted the state of the dead and some of the other doctrines, which I never got from Adventists, I got from other places and, and from the Bible. But um, so I was converted though on August 11th, and that is going to be that week is the week in which they have Glacier View. So Glacier View is. Uh, where they they meet with Desmond Ford and they go through what he's presenting. And then on August 15th, they're going to vote to remove his credentials, right? So that's when I become converted. And so when I become an Adventist in 1982, at the end of 1982, I mean, obviously these things are still hot topics within Adventism. And the Sabbath school teacher, a young guy, uh, Clarence Grosso, um, at that time, he was young. He's probably old now because I was young and I'm old. So um, I don't know if, you know if he's still alive, but uh, he was a follower of Desmond Ford. Now, he didn't say he was a follower of Desmond Ford. He's, he was actually following people like Morris Venden. But he was a follower of Desmond Ford. As time went on, I came to understand this. Now, I knew a little bit about uh, the issue with Ford. Um, uh, but, but I knew mu much more about what had happened with the evangelicals in the 1950s because the first book I read after getting baptized was Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. So, so right away as becoming an Adventist, I was trying to sort out what was going on in the Adventist church. And, um, it took me a little while because I hadn't heard of A.T. Jones or E.J. Wagner. So that's not really the topic yet, right? So it's it's about Ford and about this conflict between the conservatives and the liberals, new theology and all these types of things. Um, so it's going to be, I think about, um, so I get baptized in, so it's going to be about two years before I run across A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. Now I started ordering books from Leaves of Autumn uh, and also we had an ABC in Alberta where the guy who was running it uh, brought in a lot of Leaves of Autumn books and all kinds of other things that were sort of, uh, you know, not Adventist books, um, but stuff dealing with, you know, the Illuminati and, uh, and um, things like that. So lots of different things that I would read. Um, and I was an avid reader back then because um, we didn't have computers. So I read all the time. Uh, read all kinds of books um, on theology and history and things like that. So anyway, I read a book which I got from the church library, and it was called um, Movement, and De Movement of Destiny. So this is where I'm first going to hear about Jones and Wagner, or at least maybe their names were floating around, but they just didn't uh, stick in my head. Now, the book Movement of Destiny um, – is by Leroy Froome, 
So I'm pretty sure that many of you have uh, not good feelings about Froome. And um, now when you go on the E.G. White disc, you know, they're going to have some of Froome's books, uh, The Conditionalist Faith of Our Fathers and The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers. Now, the thing I noticed when I read Froome right from the, the get-go is that he was not an honest person. Now, how would I know that Froome is not an honest person? I mean, I'm just a new Adventist. I start reading this book of Adventist history, and I know he's not honest. Um, so Froome had uh, access to, as he talks about in the book Movement of Destiny, he had access to the E.G. White estates, to a lot of material the average Adventist could not get a hold of. And he's going to write about 1888. So I'm just trying to find his book here. I thought I had it, but. Uh, he also helped uh, write STA commentary. One of the authors. Yes, yeah. And um, I ended up uh, buying a commentary a few years later. I didn't have enough money. I was pretty poor. Uh, you know, I had lots of kids and uh, right away and. Not very good jobs. I hardly worked, actually. I was not educated but um, at that time. But anyway, um, so this book, uh, Movement of Destiny, I'm just going to bring it up here. And now, so the way that I knew that he wasn't honest is I started looking at what he was saying about Wagner's book, called Christ Our Righteousness. There's actually three different editions. There's one called uh, The Righteousness of Christ, uh, Christ Christ in His Righteousness, and Christ Our Righteousness. There's a, an Australian edition, a European edition or something, and an American edition. Anyway, they're, they have different titles, but they're basically the same book. And um, so in this, this is Froome's book, The Movement of Destiny. And, and this is where I'm first really getting a sense of how Adventists look at their own history. So I'd read Kingdom of the Cults uh, before, and um, but I hadn't read really anything about Adventist history other than what was in the Kingdom of the Cults. So I knew about Miller and the 2300 Days and those types of things, uh, the Great Disappointment, etc. cetera. So... Um, in this book, I guess what I'll do is search it. Um, see if I can find this. So you got E.J. Wagner. Um, so uh, this is yeah. So this is going to be page uh, the actual message at Minneapolis. So he's going to go through and and um, look at Wagner's message. Now, he's not going to do uh, an honest job of it, right? Because that wouldn't be Froome's way. So let me see. So I'm going to go back a few pages here. Um, so I don't want to do it this way. I'm going to do it this way. Okay. Okay, so we're going to read a little bit what he says about what Wagner's actual message at Minneapolis is. Now, I don't really like Froome as a writer. Um, uh, I mean, he's obviously a talented man, but I don't like his writing style. Okay, so, um, so he's going to talk about here, three separate sources provide the evidence. Now, some of the things he says are true, right? So, uh, I mean, the best way... Uh, to bring error to somebody is to say a bunch of things that are true, uh, but mix it with some error. So there are three separate sources provide the evidence what of Wagner's actual message was. Uh, we have three independent sources from which to determine what was presented by Dr. Elliot J. Wagner in his studies at the Epical Minneapolis Conference of 1888. First, we have the authoritative portrayals by Ellen G. White, herself a participant at the conference, 
to whose published statements of inspired veracity we have access. Her 10 studies given in the Institute and Conference proper are covered in chapter 13 that follows. While Mrs. White spoke some 20 times, at least 10 of her presentations were formal. Second, we have an addition, in addition, the eyewitness accounts of more than a score of other actual participants at the conference as they look back through the perspective of the years. These corroborative declarations here published for the first time present features that stand out unforgettably in their memories, major impressions etched into their minds that time could not efface. And these include personal experiences and relationships to the messengers and the message presented at the time and the transformations of an abiding character wrought in their own thinking, as well as seen in the attitudes and actions of others. They also include their attitudes toward the counsels of the spirit of prophecy. These unique highlights and sidelights are priceless supplemental testimony and are recorded in chapters 14 and 15. They illuminate and confirm. And it is to be particularly noted that they are in essential harmony with the two principal witnesses who wrote soon after uh, the conference, Ellen G. White and E.J. Wagner. They are trustworthy aug augmentations. Um, and then Wagner's studies were recorded in shorthand. The third, and unquestionably most significant of all, are what we have every reason to believe are the actual studies themselves, given by Wagner at the conference, preserved through the shorthand reports taken by Jesse F. Moser Wagner at the time. Here, neither the tricks of memory nor the slant of other minds intruded. These transcribed studies were edited by Wagner himself, then were put into book form, the first of which was published by the Pacific Press in October 1890. The others appeared later. They were reprinted in identical form by our Echo Publishing House in Australia in 1892, and in the same year in London in 48 Pastor, no Pastor Noster Road. So they're going to be um, in London, Australia, and in translated form in Germany and Switzerland as well, five different countries. Uh, this original distribution consequently assumes an importance of our quest that should not be underestimated. Two additional sections in the series appeared in book form in 1893 and 1900, likewise edited by Wagner, in harmony with historians' portrayal. In addition to these three independent records, we also have the authoritative account of historian Arthur W. Spalding, supplemented by that of Louis H. Christian, who was a young personal observer at the 1888 conference, though Spalding was not himself present at the session. He was close to the scene in time, a student at Battle Creek College, and had the advantage of personal acquaintance and service with some of the principal characters of the conference through the ensuing years. In fact, he was secretary to several of the leading participants. Significantly, all four sources are found to be in substantial agreement. We can therefore know for a certainty that we have a dependable portrayal of the primary points and issues discussed at this tremendously important conference. Okay, now, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, this is just me being critical of Froome, that, I mean, this is, I mean, this is the style of the day, maybe. It's a little bit bombastic. Um, not super bombastic, but a little bit. It's, it's definitely... Uh, a lot more verbiage than we need. There's a lot of uh, fancy rhetoric in it. Um, but the other thing about it is it could be way more concise. I mean, it's, you know, it, and, and I don't even know if it's all that much needed. Um, you know, uh, an example I can kind of think of here, because here we have Wagner's own notes, right? So, if we wanted to know what Wagner presented, wouldn't we just read what Wagner presented? From this transcript of what he presented that's put into a book? That would be the best yeah. evidence. It's, it's, it shouldn't be some mystery, but he presents this, there's, there's this sort of mystery of what actually was presented. You know? And then, you know, he says, well, we, we can find out what's presented and we have all these different ways. And it, it would be like... Um, Let's say, uh, you know, we were looking at some, some, some suspects for a crime, right? And, uh, you know, you say, well, here's a guy. He's got all these different qualifications. You know, he's got the same modus operandi as this crime and, and so forth. Um, but, you know, he died two years ago. So you, you wouldn't present him as a suspect. 
you understand what I'm saying. There's there's a point where one some points are more pertinent than others. And so a lot of this is just kind of my view is is just fills up a book. He's always trying to show how thorough he is about things, but he's not very concise and meaningful. None of this is really that meaningful. So when I was reading the book originally, I I noticed this all through the book. So it's, so it's just it's a style I don't like, but that's just a personal point of view. Um, but anyway, he, we we have Wagner's transcriptions, which his wife transcribes, and then are put into a book. There really is no problem in understanding what Wagner presented. It wasn't something that was hidden. But that's that's how you that's what I got when I read this book is this idea is that you know what did he really present the mystery of what was presented in 1888 general conference but it's not really much of a mystery now the problem here too is the eyewitness accounts and these people's memories about what was presented are not a reliable source of what wagner actually presented correct correct yeah my own personal experience is i can do a presentation put it on YouTube and I can hear about what I said, you know, a few days later and it will not be what I said. Right. Because when you have this sort of party spirit going on, when you have all this political stuff happening around 1888 about Jones and Wagner and all this conflict, things get distorted. Things get exaggerated. People are reading it through their own personal view and experience with A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. And, and these, these accounts are pretty much meaningless as far as knowing what Wagner actually said. Right? Agreed. Okay. So, so my view when, when I read this is I'm saying, well, who cares what these other people thought? If we got Wagner's notes, that's pretty much – Good enough for me. Now, what Ellen White says is important because she's a prophet and, and she has insights that, that you know, the average person wouldn't have. Uh, but she also doesn't have much good to say about the people who were there in 1888 and their response to Wagner. So uh, we can quite be quite assured that all of these uh, first and second hand accounts of what happened, um, that Ellen White basically is showing that that, that their characters were being maligned and they were being treated unfairly at that time. So this would be even further evidence that we, we probably shouldn't listen to all of these, the gossip and rumors and stories about what happened. Plus, one of the things that we see in uh, Froome's book is because Ellen White supported Jones and Wagner, over time, the church has to take a position that we have actually accepted Jones and Wagner's message. Initially, we, you know, there was this opposition, but we have accepted it. We have embraced it fully. And, and this is the view that Froome presents. Uh, this is also what A.G. Daniels presents. And yet, really, the message, was it understood? Well, we know it was rejected. The question is, was it ever accepted? And, no. and and my view is it never was. That is, it was never understood. Because even though we may have all of these stories and we have the spirit of prophecy, we have had a spin going on in Adventism about what happened at 1888 right from the get-go. And that spin has always been carried on. Right? So the church has always put this spin on it. So the church says, we accepted the message of Jones and Wagner. But A.T. Jones especially uh, believes in last generation theology. And, and so he completely went off track, you know, after 1888. And, um, and so pretty much, and his character was a terrible, he was a terrible person. You know, and he was very arrogant and argumentative and uh, a terrible leader when he was given responsibility. And and a lot of people didn't like him. 
And so, you know, there was this ephemeral message that was presented in 1888 that that Jones and Wagner themselves never understood really, because we understand it and we completely disagree with uh, their understanding of their own message, right? Am I giving a good portrayal of what's happened since 1888? No, you're what? giving an honest portrayal. Okay. Yeah, and, and we can see this. So even though I was a new Adventist and I didn't know all of this history, when I read the book, Movement of Destiny, I knew that Froome wasn't being honest. And I knew partly because of his style that he was hiding something, that he was trying to build a picture of something with all of this rhetoric so that the average reader who just reads on the surface would just accept what he's saying without examining it. So the simple thing to do was I had Wagner's book. So I just read Wagner's book and I found that his portrayal of what Wagner says is false. Now, I guess he's not expecting people to actually read the book or if they do that, they're just going to read superficially. They're going to take what Froome has already said about Wagner and they will read it into reading Wagner. Right. So because I was aware of what Froome was doing already, when I read Wagner, I just wanted to know what Wagner said. Is Froome agreeing with Wagner or not? And he's definitely not. So, so I knew something, something was happening in Adventism that, that I needed to be aware of. So, and I became aware of it by reading Froome. So nobody else had talked to me about it. I hadn't. I didn't have any friends yet who were into Jones and Wagner or anything like that. Uh, I might have heard the names, but I hadn't read anything at this point. And I'd got this book um, from Lee's of Autumn, uh, maybe at the ABC or something. But uh, And I knew that this was supposed to be a good book. So, so I had it. So I read it and realized, well, Froome wasn't an honest person. Um, now... I mentioned earlier that Froome had written these books, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers and The Conditionalist Faith of Our Fathers. And they're pretty exhaustive books in, in both, uh, you know, the literal sense of a book that's complete, but also exhausting to read. And the thing about the, the conditionalist faith of our fathers, some of you know of, of a guy named Fudge. Uh, can't remember his first name. And Albert Fudge or something like that. He, he wrote a book called The Fire That Consumes. And um, I read this book when I was in university. My uh, Hebrew professor said that I should read it because he says this guy uh, uh, agrees with our understanding of the state of the dead. And he's a Baptist uh, minister. And um, so Fudge, I just can't think of his first name. Um, but anyway, if you look it up, you can find it. Now, he mentions Froome's book, The Conditionalist Faith of Our Fathers. And he makes this note about Froome in, in one of the footnotes. And I, I'm just paraphrasing because it was you know, a long time ago I read the book. Um, but he basically says Froome likes to misuse quotes. He likes to take them, take quotes out of context. So he says it's a good book, but you have to be careful because Froome likes to misuse quotes. And this is the thing that I noticed in Movement of Destiny when I read it. So at the time he wrote the book, uh, we didn't have as much access to all of Ellen G. White's writings. But one of the things I noticed in, in one of the, and I can't, I'm not going to find it here, I don't think, just looking through it. But he's going to make a a... He's going to quote Ellen White and say that Ellen White is talking about A.T. Jones in a quote. But if you look up the quote, she's not talking about A.T. Jones. Now, Froome isn't stupid. I mean, he knows enough to know who she's talking about. Um, so those types of things are the things that Froome would do. So I, I don't trust Froome, and I didn't ever since I read this book, uh, Movement of Destiny. Now, um, so if you're going to evaluate 
uh, uh, Wagner's message. Um, so he's going to talk here about this found, foundational principle first enunciated. Okay, so he says, vastly more was involved in the presentation than most of us have been aware. Certain foundational features undergird and establish all that follows. Certain basic facts and principles have to be laid down before Wagner could satisfactorily proceed. For on these he builds his entire thesis, and these must be recognized in order to sense the significance of what follows. Those who did not accept these initial premises would not comprehend the latent force and intent of his outline, nor would they accept his conclusions. A divide a divided reception seemed inevitable. Wagner obviously felt that he had first to declare his position and define his terms. Before proceeding further, he felt compelled to set forth the larger majestic concept of the ineffable Christ of Scripture, Christ as all the fullness of the Godhead body. That all might, that all might understand the full meaning of his far-reaching presentation, he must first clear away certain misunderstandings and confusions that only shortly before had been accentuated by republication in enlarged form in 1844 by his own father, Joseph H. Wagner, or Dr. E.J. Wagner, or Dr. E.J. Wagner felt impelled to present, in contrast, the true Bible principles and provisions as he saw them, and above all else, he must set forth uh, the divine transcendent personality central in his chosen theme of righteousness by faith. So the one thing you do not see in this book by E.J. Wagner is what Froome says that you see that is um, the foundational principle of his presentations. Okay. So why does he do this? What is Froome pushing? The divine transcendent personality central in his chosen theme of righteousness by faith, which if you read the book, you won't find this in Wagner's book. So what is Froome pushing? What is he saying that the foundational presentation principle is that that isn't in Wagner's book, but he says it is. What is it? This divine transcendent personality. of Christ. Anybody know? What 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 do you think he's hinting at? I think he's hinting at the at the Holy Spirit, isn't he? Yeah, so he's going to be dealing with uh ideas about Christ being fully God, right? And and the Holy Spirit, the personality of the Holy Spirit. Now the thing that is foundational to Jones and Wagner's messages is actually the sinful nature of Christ. Right? That, that is the issue. If you read Wagner, and especially if you read uh, the two books on Galatians, that's uh, Butler's book on Galatians and Wagner's response to it, you'll see that the foundational principle here is that Christ is fully God and fully man. That is, he is God, but he came in our flesh. And we saw that in Wagner clearly, and or in Jones clearly when we read the 1893 and 1895 General Conference Bulletins sermons, right? That was really the main point. Now, he does address that Jesus is fully God, right? Because we need to understand his condescension. Um, but the principle is that he is, it's not so much about God's divinity that's the main principle. It has to do with, uh, Christ's, uh, or with, you know, Christ's divinity. It has to do with Christ's humanity. Right? So he's going to go and he says he first establishes the complete deity of Christ. Specifically, Wagner had to meet a minority challenge that would have undercut the complete deity of Christ our Lord and true righteousness by faith in Christ as all the fullness of Godhead. He wrote in his 1890 book, Christ and his righteousness. Our object in this investigation is to set forth Christ's rightful position of equality with the father 
in order that his power to redeem may be better appreciated. So this is true. He does show that Jesus is God, right? We need to understand that principle. But was that principle understood by every Seventh-day Adventist in 1888? Did, did, did Adventists have a tr trouble understanding that Christ was equal with the Father in 1888? No. No. So they didn't have trouble understanding that. It was, it was understood. Now, they didn't have views that the church hold, held later, which I would call the mystical trinity views. Um, they didn't have those. And those do come in in connection with uh, Kellogg. So they come in later. In, into Adventism through Kellogg and uh, and others, um, but there, but but Wagner isn't pushing that at this point. Now Wagner is going to get caught up in some of this, um, you know, pantheism as well later on. But in 1888, he's not. So he's not pushing this idea. He's just he's just stating something that's pretty common uh, to Adventism, that Christ is fully God and that he's also fully man. It wasn't wasn't some new idea. OK. So he says, then with these foundational premises clearly laid down, Wagner proceeds to build a superstructure of his studies uh, solidly based on these foundations that were now in full view. Wagner iterated and reiterated his point by employing Colossians, Colossians 2 verse 9, all the fullness of the Godhead some 15 times in his studies became, in fact, his continuing keynote phrase. Now, if you read the book, you will not, you may see it mentioned 15 times because he's going to do a study on those verses. But I don't think you could call it his keynote phrase. Um, so sequencing, sequence, reasoning, texts, and quotations. In epitomizing and analyzing his presentation section by section, we shall trace through the 13 divisions of his studies, which are really one continuing study as recorded in his first 98 page book, then continued and completed in the later publications. Significantly enough, the very wording of the title itself, Christ and his righteousness indicates um, the preeminent place he gave to a true understanding of Christ needed in order to grasp all the all inclusive provisions centered in him. We shall therefore outline and analyze the entire presentation, noting the points in the recorded sequence, the line of reasoning, main text used, and giving key quotations, both phrases and entire statements of greater importance, in Wagner's own words, with pages indicated for any who wish to study further. In this, we shall be able to quickly to get a true overall view of the Wagner presentation of righteousness by faith in 1888, the Bible study series that brought about a revival of this great truth that we have, were told had been largely lost sight of, which not one in a hundred understood the real significance at the time and the supreme importance of which Ellen White attested again and again. What some accepted and some rejected. Uh, through this means we shall know exactly what was accepted by some, rejected by some, and avoided or viewed with uncertainty by some, as Mrs. White characterizes three group reactions. In this way, we shall learn just what it was that became a matter of regrettable continuing controversy over a period of years. So one is, he's going to show that, that this is about ideas that are accepted and rejected. But what was the primary reason the message was rejected? Was it some kind of intellectual rejection of what was being presented? Was this a cerebral, well thought out uh, consideration of what Wagner was presenting that caused them to reject what Wagner was presenting? What, what we can know about this history is that it was a rejection of the messengers first and foremost, it was a matter of envy more than anything else. It was a matter of of territory. It was territorial. Very much. Yeah. So 
So talk about all of these things, you know, what was it that was accepted by some and rejected by some? That's not really even what Ellen White's talking about. So he's misrepresenting what Ellen White's saying about 1888. But also really why, why the message was rejected. I mean, the message wasn't rejected on intellectual terms. It was, it was rejected more because of the party spirit had developed within, within Adventism. Uh, and they talked about these upstarts, you know, these young upstarts. Who are they to tell us or to teach us, basically, right? And that Ellen White supported them was reason to actually end up rejecting spirit of prophecy. Because the fact that she would support these young men who were undermining our message, and, and all they were doing was misrepresenting what Jones and Wagner were presenting. They, they weren't interested in what they were presenting. So, so this whole thing about the different groups and reactions are, are kind of immaterial. It's not really what Ellen White's talking about. <clears throat> and we shall thus be able to tell just what Ellen White had endorsed and championed, which in time came to be accepted as sound and foundational by the denomination as a whole. Now, the reason why he's doing this, this sentence hides something. Because we, we shall thus be able to tell just what Ellen White had endorsed and championed, right? That is, there's an implication here that there, we have to discern which parts of Jones and Wagner's message Ellen White was accepting and which part she was rejecting. Does that make sense? Would you repeat that, please? Okay. In this sentence is hidden, this underlying idea, it's a subtext here, that since we need to tell just what it was Ellen White had endorsed and championed, that means there must have been things that Jones and Wagner taught that Ellen White did not endorse and champion. Agreed. Right. Yeah. That's hidden in this sentence. Right. And hopefully you can see that. That it's, it's, uh, and, and you see it when you read the whole book. The idea is that we accept Jones and Wagner's message. But not everything they said, just the stuff that Ellen White endorsed and championed, because they were teaching lots of error as well. Right? That's been the message in Adventism about Jones and White. And so we can say we accepted the message, but only the stuff that Ellen White endorsed and championed, which they, of course, have to distort Ellen White's uh, writings in order to, to get that. They have to frame everything in such a way. So this is this is the mess that Adventism uh, got into. And when I came into Adventism, we were just going to begin reevaluating because I believe of of, of um, a Glacier View with Ford, uh, reevaluating as Seventh Day Adventists what really 1888 was about. What was the message of righteousness by faith? And, and so I came into the church just at that time, into the 80s. Now, we're going to get a 1988 book called uh, A.T. Jones from um, uh, 1888 to Apostasy, right? And that's by George R. Knight. It's going to be where George Knight uh, becomes this star in, in Adventism. And he becomes this historian who becomes the church historian, and he's a revisionist historian, uh, like uh, Froome was. So he's he's going to do even more to undermine the message of Jones and Wagner, while claiming that we actually accepted the message. But it's here in Froome as well. So he says here, inasmuch as few today are really aware of the tremendous issues centering in and revolving around the 1888 turning point in our history of the battle hard fought, and the victory so dearly won, we now turn to the section by section, a major point by point presentation of Wagner's conference studies in their simple, straightforward form. Um, so um, three progressive divisions unfold. As noted by Dr. Wagner's study, encompassing the approach and initial emphasis, the definitive development, the practical conclusions of his great theme were to divide it into 13 sections or divisions. First, observe their wording as given in the contents of his Christ and his righteousness. 
and then the three logical divisions or groupings into which they fall. How shall we consider Christ? Is Christ God? Christ is creator. Is Christ the created being? Uh, God manifest in the flesh. So in this here, you're going to see Froome uh, characterizing um, Wagner's message particularly different because Wagner is quite clear that he believes that Christ is begotten, not created, right? Which is not a position that the church uh, holds and Froome did not hold. So he's not going to have that. Um, and that was the one particular point which I really first noticed is how uh, uh, Wagner looks at Christ's um, as being begotten, not created. So, uh, so that is there. But what we don't get is this uh, mystical Trinity idea. And then God manifests in the flesh. So this is very similar to what Jones presented. Jones presents that Jesus is the creator. He's God. He's, he's God manifest in the flesh. Right. And, um, For some reason, my thing is frozen. Okay. Important practical lessons. That's chapter six. Christ, the lawgiver, the righteousness of God, the Lord, our righteousness, accepted with God, the victory of faith, bond servants and free men, practical illustrations of deliverance from bondage. So you can look at these titles. These are very similar to what Jones would present, right? And we've gone through lots of Jones. So this could easily be topics or titles in Jones' papers. And um, so Wagner is presenting that same message. Now, he's he's presenting it differently than Jones. Jones is very repetitive. Um, Wagner has a different style. I've always preferred Jones over Wagner. Um Wagner sometimes can be a little a, a little more difficult to understand what he's actually saying than, than Jones is. Um, but but they're both very clear on what righteousness by faith is. Um, so he says, impelled to notice false no false concepts. The first six sections deal with the transcendent nature and all encompassing deity of Christ as stated, to establish this foundational truth was Wagner's first concern. He felt impelled to take note of certain false concepts, as well as to present the positive truth of Christ's complete deity and eternal place in the Godhead or Trinity. Now, did E.J. Did e. Wagner believe in the Trinity? No. No, right? He would never use that term. But you can see one of the things that Froome was really pushing was the, this mystical trinity. And he's going to try to make Wagner promoting this mystical trinity, which Wagner doesn't do. Right. But he's going to say the Godhead or trinity and his infinite attributes and prerogatives. So as really to comprehend the Christ whose righteousness we are to seek and to receive. Now, one of the things about Christ's righteousness we know that Christ is fully God, but that righteousness, does it come from his personal attributes? When we read Jones, did Christ's righteousness that he manifested while on earth come from his own personal attributes? No. No. Whose righteousness was it? The father's. It was his father's righteousness. Exactly. So. One of the errors that Froome is introducing here is that Christ is righteous because he is God. But Christ is demonstrating his father's righteousness in humanity. We, now, it's Christ's character. We know that, that Christ comes to demonstrate his father's character, but he doesn't demonstrate his own righteousness. He says, the works that you see me do, they come from the Father. And it's because I and the Father are one. It's his personal connection as a human being with his Father in heaven that he can now demonstrate the righteousness of his Father. 
as our example. And this is the idea that that Froome is, is pushing is this idea that it's because he's God that he can produce this righteousness. And that's totally contrary to what Jones and Wagner are presenting. They're showing that he's God because of his condescension and the fact that he actually had the power to produce righteousness on his own, but he's not going to produce that righteousness on his own. He's going to do it by faith. He's not going to be demonstrating his, his, his own righteousness. He's going to be demonstrating his father's righteousness. And so this idea that Christ is this, you know, this God who is so, I mean, Christ is God. We know that, but he's also fully man. And, and that is uh, the main focus of Jones and Wagner's message on how Christ is righteous. But he's not righteous because he is God. He's righteous because of his relationship with his father. He's demonstrating God's character. He, you know, he was born of a woman, born under the law, under the condemnation of the law. He took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition. But what people try to do, what Froome tries to do, what the church was trying to do in the 50s and has still continued to do, is present the idea that Christ could not have taken upon himself our nature in its fallen condition, but must have taken upon a nature that that is a pre-fall nature of Adam, not the post-fall nature of Adam. So if he's the second Adam, he's not the second Adam after Adam fell. He's the second Adam. Like Adam. What? What's that, Jeff? Well, it sounds like Desmond Ford. Yes. Desmond Ford believed that. Something like that, too. Yeah, now Desmond Ford, the reason why he believed what he believed um, uh, in in his own personal testimony, is that that was what he was taught. Desmond Ford, the, the mistake that he made is he was he was honest about his beliefs. He was honest in his beliefs about righteousness by faith, because that's what he was taught. And he was honest in his beliefs about uh, the prophetic periods, right? And many of the pastors um, who stayed in the church were still Fordites. That is, they still agreed with Ford because that's what they were taught. But they just felt that Ford moved too fast for the membership because they're the elite. They know what the truth is. We're just a bunch of ignorant rubes who believe all kinds of things that, you know, obviously aren't correct just because we're simple minded. And if we try to move too fast for these, for the church, um, then, you know, we're just going to lose you know, there, there's going to be a rebellion. So we got to do it slowly. Uh, and when it comes to ideas of the Trinity, uh, you know, Froome, I believe it's Froome, you know, says that we just have to wait for this generation to die off. Because if we can start with the young people teaching them these ideas from the beginning, then we won't have a problem. And um, that's a real paraphrase. <laughs> and then, not what, j just, yeah. as, just as a question. Yeah. When did the teaching of the Trinity first come into the church? Well, after the death of Ellen White. Okay, but do you know the year? Um, when, when it actually, they started using the word Trinity? When it was actually being taught within the church itself. Um, I'm trying to remember. I used to know the year. Uh, I mean, they put it in a statement of beliefs. Um, the that 30s? Were yeah, it was in the 30s. I just can't remember which year. But it, it's quite a bit later, right, that we're going to actually start using the term Trinity. The term the term Trinity began yeah. to be used in the church about 1926. Okay, 26. Okay. And so after Ellen White's death. Correct. Who was the major proponent of the teaching of the Trinity at that time? Froom? Yes. Yeah. Because he wrote a book, um, uh, The Coming of the Comforter. 
That's right. Um, yeah, which I read back in in uh, 1984. So, <clears throat> and and I noticed Froome when I read his book, The Coming of the Comforter. It was pretty obvious that what Froome was teaching was not uh, what I read in the Spirit of Prophecy or in the Bible regarding uh, the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. So, so Froome is is here. He's just pushing his ideas using uh you know wagner to do it but when you read it you don't see in wagner's writing these ideas that uh Frum is painting him with painting his message with okay <clears throat> so the second part of group section seven to nine deals with the nature and scope of the righteousness we are to receive the third and final grouping sections 10 to 13 deals with the nature of the life of victory the final chapter is likewise on the practical aspect of this wondrous, wondrous righteousness phase. The sequence is significant with the importance of the whole approach indicated by the contents. The title page carries two texts, one each from the Old and New Testaments. The key phrases are, Lord our righteousness, um, Christ Jesus made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All in company, encompassing transcendence of Christ, pages five to eight, our introductory dealing with the directive injunction to consider Christ Jesus. Yeah, the church had an official ecumenical statement in 1926. I'm uh, reading here in the chat um, as well. Okay, so um, consider Christ Jesus, Hebrews 3.1. This is followed by Paul's admonition to keep Christ continually before the people and his determination not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Wagner stresses that Paul's declaration, declared mission was to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, further that Christ is the only name under heaven whereby we can be saved, and that no man can come unto the Father but by him. Um, he is to be lifted up that men should not perish but have eternal life as the crucified Redeemer, whose grace and glory are sufficient to supply the world's greatest need, such is the imperative preeminence of Christ. Now, part of the problem with this analysis, so the thing that I find about Froome is he says a lot of words, but he doesn't say anything, right? Do you notice this? You're being overly kind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's it's stuff that's, it's it's all fluff on the surface, Right. It, you know, it's all sprinkles and and glitter. Is it but, fluff or is it chaff? Well, yeah, chaff. But it's made to look like something, right? He he tries to make it look like he's saying something substantive, but he's not. He's not giving us any information about what this message is that Jones or, or Wagner here is presenting, what Jones and Wagner presented, but particularly Wagner here. Um, because... He's just taking some of the phrases, but without the meaning behind them. That is, we don't see what Wagner is actually saying, right? So this is supposed to be uh, an analysis. And then he's just going to quote Wagner here. What a range from ignorance and sin to righteousness and redemption. And this introduction is illustrative of the fact that his presentation is saturated throughout with Scripture and with Christ. It is preeminently a Bible study and a Christ-centered Bible study series. Now, you know, this word Christ-centered, what, what's wrong with it? Not is, sure. it <laughs> is it possible to do a Bible study that's not Christ-centered if you're using a Bi the Bible correctly? Because isn't Christ everywhere in the scriptures? Yes. Yeah. And 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 to me, these are what um, um, uh, George Orwell would call non-terms. Right? We have a lot of this rhetoric, these words. This is like political speech or political writing. When you talk about things like progress, you know, Christ-centered is one of those things. It doesn't mean anything, right? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah. It's like talking about progress. Everybody's for progress. I mean, who isn't? 
but does it mean anything? <laughs> it's just it's just a word. If you talk about you know Christ centered the Bible studies, you know I I don't know if there was ever a Christ centered Bible study um, by the pioneers. Everything they did was Christ centered, right? Because everything in the Bible is about Christ. It's all about Christ. So it's it's just you know meaningless rhetoric. Majesty and preeminence of God. Plunging directly into his subject in section one, how shall we consider Christ? Wagner finds Christ revealed in the word as the one to whom is committed all judgment, judging between the highest prerogative. Consequently, he is to receive the same honor that is due to God. And for the reason that he is God. Um, how? I'm not sure why they put that there. He is the divine word who was in the beginning before the world came into being, um, existing from the days of eternity, Micah 5, verse 2, as far back in ages of eternity as to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. So here, this is the, one of the things that I noticed when I read this, is I said, okay, well, let's see what Wagner actually says. So um, I'm going to. Cue it up here. I don't know if I can find it uh, quickly. Uh, so E.J. Wagner and Christ in His Righteousness. And I'm going to search here, and then I'll show it to you once I find it here. Okay, so let's, let's see what Wagner actually says. <clears throat> so he, he's going to say here, Christ is committed the highest prerogative, that of judging. So Christ is a judge. He must receive the same honor that is due to God and for the reason that he is God. The beloved disciple bears this witness. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God, John 1, 1, that this divine word is none other than Jesus Christ is shown by verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. The word was in the beginning. The mind of man cannot grasp the ages that are spanned in this phrase. It is not given to men know, to know when or how the son was begotten. But we know that he was the divine word, not simply before he came to this earth to die, but even before the world was created. Right. So we get a very different view of what Wagner is saying, because Wagner is quite clearly saying Christ is begotten. Right. But does he say that here in his analysis of what Wagner is saying? No, no. He, he leaves that out. He just says, in the beginning before the world came into being, right? He's the word who was in the beginning before the world came into being, existing from the days of eternity, so far back in the ages of eternity as to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. You don't get anywhere here that he's talking about the origins of Christ as being begotten, right? Correct. Right. So, so there I can say, obviously, Froome is not stupid. He knows what Wagner actually says, but he misquotes him intentionally because he wants Wagner to be supporting his idea that Christ is not begotten at all, right? Because when do when when the church now talks about Christ being begotten, when is he begotten? From eternity past, isn't it? No, the church now teaches he's begotten. He becomes the son of God when? When he went at the incarnation, right? Okay. You, you'll find this, uh, that that's what they're teaching about Christ. That he's not begotten in the days of eternity. He's begotten. He become is he the eternal son of God? Is he always been the son of God, according to the Trinitarian idea being promoted in the church? 
This is just a role that he took on, correct? Right. Right. He's not the son of God in in the Trinitarian view that the church has been promoting in, in the things that I've read and the sermons that I've heard. They're saying this idea that he was begotten, they equate that with the idea that he was created, that he had some beginning. Now, the problem that we have here is that we cannot understand uh, the Godhead. We cannot understand the origins of God. I mean, we know God is eternal. And we know that the Son is eternal. The problem is, do we know what eternal means? I would have to say no. Yeah, we don't know what that means, right? But we do know that the Bible says that he was begotten in the days of eternity, whose going forth had been from old from the days of eternity, which is what he's going to say right here, right? So he says, uh, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of, of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that shall be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old from the days of eternity. Broom is just going to quote from the days of eternity. So far back in ages of eternity is to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. But he's not going to quote the part where it says his goings forth have been from old. From the days of eternity. We know that Christ proceeded and came forth from God. Right? That's what it says. Do they put that in? Does Froom quote that? No, he's not going to. Right? He's not going to put that there. Right? But it was so far back um, in the ages of eternity as to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. He's not going to show that that's what he's saying is so far back in the ages of eternity. So, so what is the problem? I mean, I'm not an, I'm not, I'm not with all of what's happening in Adventism with the anti-Trinitarians in the approach that they're using, because they are actually diminishing Christ as some kind of lesser being, right? So. What they're trying to do is they're trying to understand something that can't be understood, and they're trying to understand it in human terms. My approach has always been, I mean, I would, I would personally say that from other Christians' perspective, when I became an Adventist, what I was baptized with the baptismal vows, is that I understood that Adventists were tritheists that we weren't Trinitarians. That's, that's what I understood. That's the term that if you look into what, how other people would see how Adventists understood the Godhead, they would characterize us as tritheists. I don't think that's necessarily the best way to describe it because the Bible doesn't talk about tritheism either. But we do have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these represent the Godhead. And, and they are personal. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. And, and God is presented to us in this way. The Father dwells in unapproachable light. No man has ever seen his face. It's impossible to. Christ is the revelation of the Father. The Holy Spirit is Christ present when Christ, because Christ has humanity. Um, and without without the Holy Spirit, Christ's Spirit, there's no that way that we could have communion with Christ because He is now a man. So, how that's understood, how we are to understand this, I don't think is essential to salvation to explain it. But we do need to accept the basic teachings of Scripture. We need to. We can't go beyond the Bible. Once we try to explain something that's beyond our ability to understand, we're basically being foolish as far as I'm concerned, right? And Alan White says as much. We can't, we yeah, can't you know, understand you certain hear, things. You hear, a lot of, you hear a lot of that nowadays, you know, on Facebook and such. Right. So there are things that we need to know, but those things are revealed clearly in the scriptures. 
right? But I've seen people try to argue, you know, that the whole idea of baptizing the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is wrong because one place it says to baptize in the name of Jesus. Well, obviously, you know, you're baptizing in the name of Jesus. If you look at the context, they're talking about John's baptism, right? So they have to be baptized into Christ. So at different times, they're going to talk about different things, but we are commanded to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, right? So people twist the scriptures. And, and in order to understand this issue, the simplest thing to do is just accept what the Bible says and, and don't try to, to answer all of these complicated, impossible to answer questions about the nature of God. We just don't understand much about it. We know that God is eternal. We know that Christ is preexistent. Right? He's, he exists before all things. He's the creator of the universe, right? Everything that we see is created by the sun, right? He's the one that spoke the world into existence. He's also Jehovah, right? So that, type, that title of Jehovah is applied to Christ in the New Testament. We know the Holy Spirit is God, but he's also the spirit of Christ. And so, you know, when we try to imagine, you know, how the Holy Spirit and the Christ and the Father work and we take some verses here and some other verses there, and we try to paint this picture of what we think, we, we are just doing the Bible and the truth a disservice. But this is the problem here, is that Adventists in the past understood that Christ had come from God, that he was begotten. They don't know what that means, right? We can't understand it. It's in the days of eternity, right? But, but there's some way in which the son proceeds from the father. Right? How that is and what that means, we don't know. But Christ is eternal. Right? So we can't grasp eternity. But, but you see the point. Wagner is not teaching this, what Froome is teaching. It's definitely not a foundational principle of his presentations if he's not teaching it. So, so this, this is the problem that we have in Adventism today, is that we do not understand uh, the 1888 message. We think we do because we're told that we do. We think the church accepts it, accepted it at some point because we're told that it did but what they what they are promoting is not the original message of Jones and Wagner <clears throat> so such is the majesty and preeminence of the Christ uh, that Wagner thus introduced but he is also the one who was made flesh and dwelt among us through the incarnation right so of course he's going to mention this but it's, it's not he is also the one. I mean, this is the main point of Wagner's message, is that Christ is fully man just as much as he is fully God. It's Hebrews chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 2. Jones does the same presentation. Uh, possesses all the attributes and prerogatives of God. Continuing in section 2, is Christ God? Wagner presses on the awesome fact that Christ is God, the mighty God, even the Lord Jehovah. From this, he goes to Christ's second advent, how our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Psalm 50, verse 1, how a fire shall devour before him. It shall be very tempestuous round about him, how he will call to heaven and earth that he may judge his people. He may gather his saints unto him, lest the heaven shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Along with this, Wagner places the sobering declarations of Matthew 24, verse 31, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, John 5, 28 and 29, and 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, as evidence that these all refer to Christ as vivid descriptions of the second advent, for he comes as the mighty God, the salvation of his people. Mighty God, Wagner adds, is one of his rightful titles. God the Father, in direct address to the Son, called him by the same title. Thus thy throne of God is forever and ever, and thus his name is by his right of inheritance. So basically, this is just an expansion of Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> Then comes Wagner's further declaration that the Son has all the nature, has by nature all the attributes of deity. 
Wagner presses the point that this is not simply a position to which Christ has been elevated, but is inherently his by right. We must admit that to us today, it seems strange that anyone could make such sweeping and obviously biblical confessions, and yet, as will be seen elsewhere, stop short of admitting the beginninglessness, eternal preexistence of Christ. But it is an example of the outreach for truth that for that today, it was nevertheless a tremendous advance. So he's going to be clear here that he doesn't admit the beginninglessness, eternal preexistence of Christ. Now, what Jones, what Wagner does is quite clearly the same as what Jones has done. Jones has the same idea that Christ is begotten in the days of eternity. But what Wagner is doing is much more biblical in that he is, because does the Bible describe a beginningless eternity, pre-existence of Christ? I mean, what does that even mean, right? Is, is this a necessary prerequisite to understanding and knowing and having a relationship with God and with Christ? I would say no. Yeah. It, to me, it's just like, well, it's a bunch of language that doesn't really mean anything. I mean, if you're going to argue about whether Christ had a beginningless eternal preexistence or whether he was just begotten in the days of eternity, and yet we can't understand what that means, does it really make any difference? Because we're trying to declare as something that, that must be true. Right. Because, you know, we think it must be true that Christ had this. And yet the Bible doesn't really speak of it. You know, I think the reason why he stopped short of admitting it is that the Bible says nothing about it. We know about his pre-existence, Right. But a beginningless eternal pre-existence, it's not a concept that we even know what it would mean. And the Bible doesn't address it. It just says his goings forth have been from old, from the days of eternity. To me, that doesn't sound like a beginningless eternal preexistence, but I'm not even sure what that means. So, so are we starting to get a point here, the problem that is happening with this message, with the message of righteousness by faith, that the best way to understand this message is to read Jones and Wagner for yourself. Which is what we want to do, uh, is we're going to go through Wagner's book uh, next week. But we can see that there's a distortion that has happened here. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? good presentation tonight yeah the one thing i was thinking of of looking at was when i started looking at it myself reading through it was um ag daniel's book on christ our righteousness or whatever it's called it's a similar title to to wagner's book um so ag daniels is going to make this case that the message of 1888 was accepted and by him now, the problem when I start reading through his book is it's it's much the same sort of writing as Froome. That is, it has lots of nice words, but not much substance. Now, you know, I'm a very direct communicator. I like direct communication. I like somebody to tell me what it is they're saying and what it is they're not saying. And so I don't like to have to read between the lines to figure out what somebody is, is trying to say. But the basic point I think we get from uh, A.G. Daniel's book is that he doesn't fully understand uh, the nature of Christ and what righteousness by faith is. But he uses some of the same language that Jones and Wagner use. And, and what has happened? Um, so. Um, George Orwell 
wrote a, a paper, and I'm trying to remember the title of it, but it's it's dealing with the use of language in in politics. I can't, just can't remember the exact title. Um, but the idea about language, language is meant to communicate ideas. That's the purpose. The reason why we have words is we, we have some ideas and we want to communicate them. And political speech uh, doesn't want to communicate. Right? It doesn't, a politician doesn't want to tell you what he's actually thinking. He wants you to think that he's thinking something different than he's actually thinking so that you will vote for him, but then he can act in the way that he wants, right? So political writing in religion should never happen. We need to be, our yes must be yes and our no must be no. Now, sometimes when we get a little bit analytical and we're getting a little bit deep and we're trying to understand some things, people can accuse us of being wishy-washy or unclear. But sometimes in order to be clear, you do have to tear things apart so that you can see the different parts and put them back together so that people can see clearly how something is structured or understood. And the one thing that Jones does is that very thing when he presents. Wagner does as well in a little bit different way, but he wants you to clearly see what he is saying. He's not, he's not using just language to mislead you, but both Froome and A.G. Daniels do just that very thing. And so what you can do with A.G. Daniels, same thing you can do with a politician. If you're reading on the surface, you can think that they agree with what you understand. But that can be true even if another person who doesn't think like you at all is reading it. Do you understand what I'm saying there? So, for instance, um, the book, The 27 Fundamental Beliefs, if you read there about the nature of Christ, if you believe that Christ had a sinful human nature, it seems to be saying that. But if you believe that Christ had a sinless human nature, you can read it as if it's agreeing with you because it's written in a political way. So the language is vague enough that people on opposite sides of the understanding of something important can actually read it and agree with it. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So, so that's the way uh, Daniels writes. A.G. Daniels, he writes in the same way that Froome writes. And so I don't really want to read it. I started reading through it because I've run into people who've read the book and say, it's a wonderful book on righteousness by faith. Why don't you like it? You know, I say, well, because I've read it. And he's not teaching what Jones and Wagner's, Wagner are teaching, but you have to be very careful. So, so I don't know if it's the best thing to do is read Jones and Wagner. So anyway, the point is next Friday, we're going to read, um, start reading uh, the righteousness of Christ or Christ and our righteousness or Christ and his righteousness. However, whichever title it has. Okay, so thanks everyone. Let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the work of your Holy Spirit. We are thankful that um, you can speak to our hearts. We know, Lord, that if we are searching for truth, that you can expose error. I know when I was a new Adventist and I, I was searching for truth, that you were there to point out where there was error and where it would lead. And I'm thankful for that. I pray this for each person, that we can always pray and seek to have that spiritual eyesight, not just to see errors in other people's ideas, but to see the truth so that we can see the errors in our own hearts. The reason that you've given us this message is not to beat down and attack others who don't understand it, but so that we can be changed. We can truly have a character 
that can win people to Christ who are seeking for truth and that will condemn those who have rejected light. And we pray, Lord, that we will not be those that have rejected light, that we can accept the truth as it is in Jesus. Be with each person throughout this Sabbath in the study tomorrow morning as well. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.